right, hello and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm Dale, the host. Um, and I just wanted to do a very quick, short episode here um, on my, because I posted up my essay, my academic essay on the issue of acrasia for my philosophy of mind uh, class in, in the grad seminar there. Um, and I just wanted to give a take, kind of respond to some, some notes uh, that the prof gave to me in terms of the comments to clarify my ideas a bit. Um, and also just talk it through, you know, some people prefer not to read and that sort of thing, even when it's short, it's only 3,000 words um, was our max limit. Um, but yeah, some people prefer an audio version, so I just wanted to, to do that for you guys. Um, just before we get into that, so some quick announcements. I'm gonna, I'm thinking of doing this also for, I posted up my academic essay on the philosophy of emotions class, outlining what I think the role of emotions are, serving as moral heuristics. Um, to, for us to gain moral knowledge and that sort of thing. So I might do a, a quick solo show on that as well. Um, but if not, I, I have um, Dr. Michael Malona, who is my teacher for that class. Um, he's coming on early March to, to speak about the philosophy of emotions anyway. So either way, you will get a show on emotions, um, but uh, you might get a, a second one. I might do a quick solo show just explaining my own essay and my theories in a bit more detail for people as well. So. Yeah, and, and apart from that, we've got lots of guests lined up. So we've got L Dr. Lydia McGrew wants to come back on in February, late February, uh, with David Johnson to discuss uh, her case for the resurrection, maximal facts approach for the resurrection. We've, as I said, Dr. Michael Malona. We've got Dr. Liz Jackson and, and some other guests uh, lined up that are in the works. So look out for that. Um, so yeah, let, with that said, let's get into this quick topic uh, about the issue of acrasia or weakness of the will. So in my essay, I wanted to set this up. I wanted, again, to do it from a Christian perspective. I, I want to be as responsible as I can as a Christian philosopher and whenever possible, um, incorporate a Christian perspective on things. And on that front, I sort of set up my essay starting with the biblical story of creation. And, and the fall of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis chapters 1 to 3. And the reason I wanted to focus on that specifically is, okay, we live in a fallen world. Um, we have a sinful nature. We're, our wills are distorted. Our cog All of our noetic faculties are, are distorted and tainted by this sin disease, as I call it, or, or our sinful nature. And, you know, you get the Apostle Paul talking about struggling against the flesh versus his spiritual side and, and all of this sort of thing. And all of these, the sin, the sin nature post the fall is a rel I do think is relevant to questions on acrasia and weakness of the will and why, why we fail. Why do we choose, freely choose to do wrong things and, and accrue moral blameworthiness through, through doing these things. But Specifically, I think if we want to find out what weakness of the will is, aka this acrasia phenomenon, in its purest form, you know, the, the, what is the essence of acrasia or, the, or this weakness of the will phenomenon, then we have to go before the effects of sin took place. We have to go to that quote-unquote moment of drama, as Tamar Shapiro calls it, at the moment of the fall. Adam and Eve were created perfect, the Bible says. They, they were uncontaminated by a sinful nature, but yet they made the wrong decision. They screwed up and sinned, and therefore everything went out of whack from that. So as Christians, how do we make sense of that? And I, I think the answer to this, what explains how it's even possible that perfect creatures, morally, morally perfect creatures, I should say, uh, could make a free will choice to sin. Well, how does that make sense? And, and the answer is, the mechanism is a crazy. They had a, a weakness of the will, and they chose poorly. They chose the sinful choice, leading to all the devastating consequences uh, on that front. So this is why um, we need to focus on that moment of drama, right when Adam and Eve are making that choice, do I eat or not eat this fruit? Um, you know, where they're on a libertarian free will perspective, my, my thesis does not support compatibilism at all. So I, I say that they were inclined, but not thereby determined to eat this fruit. And uh, just a quick note of cl clarification on this. Obviously, I'm not necessarily saying that, oh, the story of Genesis has to be literally historical in terms of, 
yeah, they they took a, they ate the fruit and there's the snake and all of that. As regular listeners will know, I kind of favor um, in terms of the genre of the early chapters of Genesis, Genesis chapters one through eleven. It is the mytho historical genre, so I don't take um, the story totally literally in all of its secondary details. I do take Adam and Eve to be historical people. I do take the fall to be historical. So they did disobey God. They made a choice to disobey God in some way. Um, It doesn't necessarily have to be they literally ate a fruit and that's how it happened from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and all of that stuff. I take that to be more symbolic. Um, But by the same token, maybe it is literal. I am open and I respect uh, people who think that all of Genesis is of the regular historical genre and they take these details literally. Um, That's great. It doesn't matter for our purposes either way, whether, you know, the the form in which Adam and Eve chose to, through weakness of the will, chose to disobey God, whether they literally ate a fruit or not, a forbidden fruit or not, that doesn't matter for our purposes. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm just keeping it simple and just reading the story as it is, um, totally independently of any questions of the genre of Genesis or the historicity of the specifics and that sort of thing. So yeah, just wanted to say that. Um, And obviously Genesis says, well, they were blameworthy. They were punished for what they did. They were morally accountable for the choice that they made as a result of this weakness of the will. So weakness of the will does incur uh, moral blameworthiness on the agent, the moral agent, or the free will agent who makes uh, the wrong choice. Um, so that sort of sets up what we're doing here. And in my essay, so this is part of what we had to write. So we had to give perspectives of a couple of philosophers on the weakness of will, starting with Susan Wolf and then getting into Tamar Shapiro. So starting with Susan Wolf, what does she think this weakness of the will is? And you know, in the in the first place, just before we get into Susan Wolf, so the prof kind of asked me. I give a definition of a crazy error, what weakness of the will is, just generally speaking, um, and he, I think he's right. I, I was kind of unclear in the definition I gave, but just sort of a libertarian version of free will uh, as a general definition uh, would be sort of an occasion where a person fails to act act in keeping with their own personal preferences. Uh, they don't do what they want to, they truly want to do. Uh, again, there's got to be some ambiguity in there um, just because it, it's, I'm giving a generalized term and I'll let the specific, you'll see how the specifics play out later on. But yeah, get, getting into Susan Wolf. So she has this very interesting hybrid view of libertarian free will versus compatibilistic free will. And she has an asymmetric notion of freedom. It's not symmetrical. It's not balanced. And this was her brilliant brainwave um, back in 1980 with her article. And I've linked to that article on my blog site. So go, you can get that for free. It's a great read. I highly recommend it. But yeah, her her notion. So in the first place, she said that, um, look, um, freedom it's, it's not so much dependent on metaphysical conceptions. Most of the time when you're discussing free will and that debate, it's, it always goes to metaphysical conceptions. What does it mean to be free? What are those, if you remember in my own series, I covered those five conditions. I, I went over those with Chris Date in, in a great debate in the context of Calvinism versus Molinism, the ability condition, the rationality condition, the control condition, these types of debates. And Susan Wolf says, no, get, get rid of all that stuff. Forget the metaphysical debates. That's irrelevant. Freedom is ultimately grounded in conceptions of moral value. It's morality. Whether something's moral or not, that's fundamental to whether you have freedom or not. Um, so she, she has these two conditions, the condition of freedom and the condition of value, specifically moral value, that has to be filled in order for you to be considered quote unquote free. So in terms of the asymmetric notion of freedom that Susan Wolf gives, I posted uh, on my website my uh, another essay, academic essay I did on G.E. Moore and his compatibilistic notion of freedom. And what we said there, his main condition, just going with a simplistic account, was that freedom is dependent on the ability condition. You have to have the ability to do other than you do, 
quote unquote, given that you choose to do so. So that's his key qualifier. And of course, the, the problem with G.E. Moore is that this is totally, it, it commits the fallacy of equivocation. What does it mean to choose given determinism? You're not, you're never choosing in any real sense of the word. You have no control over what you're choosing. It, it, his is all just based on mo modal logic, you know, well, there's a, a possible world where you quote unquote show were determined to choose differently than what you did. Um, and that's sufficient for freedom according to Moore. Um, but it, yeah, it's obviously my, my qualms with that aside. Um, the, the main thing here is the ability condition is the freedom, freedom is entailed when you have the ability to do other than what you do, given that you choose to. Now, Susan Wolf takes this concept of, of G.E. Moore's and, and qualifies it a little bit more in terms of her condition of freedom and how it makes sense with psychological determinism. So she says, well, look, what types of, what does it mean to be free? Well, it, it's, we have the ability to do other than we do, given that there are good and sufficient reasons to do so. She basically says, well, look, it, when we do something good, a morally good or praiseworthy action, the freedom that we want is the freedom to be determined um, by the true and the good, this ultimate Kantian notion. You know, we Christians in our context, we say to be determined by God's nature, you know, what's true about the world and what's good. We want to be determined. We, we don't want the freedom. Do you really want the freedom to be uh, bad or to to do false things or believe in false things no you you want to be determined and, and there are some Christians that think this way they think God is like this they think God is determined by his own nature he, he can't be free it's an imperfection to think of him being free uh, to sin or something like that now I personally disagree with that I think no God has to have exactly the free will that there is a strict, logically possible world where gods can sin. Um, and, you know, this is co controversial in Christian thought, but I do think this. Um, but there's no feasible world where God would choose to sin or something like that, um, given his morally perfect nature and that sort of thing. But I do think it is strictly, logically possible. There's no logical contradiction in supposing that God could lie or God could sin or something like that. So I disagree with Wolf's take here, but again, this is just Wolf's view. She, she says determinism or compatibilism, um, and specifically she's talking about psychological determinism. That's what we want. We want to be determined by the true and the good. But asymmetrically, the reverse is, not, is also not the case. So when it comes to morally bad or blameworthy actions, there she's indeterm she's indeterminist uh she's a lib she's like a libertarian free will advocate almost and she just says well it's it's it, you know what could explain your bad action uh well uh, either one of two cases either you you've gone through moral neglect you've neglected to find out what your moral duties are in a given circumstance or two related to a crazy of what we're interested in a case of moral weakness um, and that those those cases in terms of the mechanism, it's just inexplicable for Susan Wolf. How how is it someone could experience a crazia or a weakness of the will? Uh, sh shrug your shoulders. I don't know. It's it's just it's in it's incompatible with psychological determinism, and I don't have an explanation. It just happens. That's that's what Susan Wolf says. It's an inexplicable phenomena. Somehow it just happens. Um, now, now, why does, I should say something, why does Susan Wolf have this asymmetrical notion? And it, it comes down to how she defines that condition for freedom, right? Because it comes down to the quote-unquote ability to do otherwise so long as there had been good, morally good, she means by that, and sufficient reason to have done so, right? So those two factors, the true and the good, determined by the true and the good. So when it comes to good action, if you're thinking in terms of modal logic, well, of course, you, you are just determined. That's the, the ultimate, because 
there's only um, the the only way you could have done otherwise or had the ability to do otherwise is if you do what GE Moore did and you go to another possible logically possible world. It, it's our ability is dependent upon counterfactuals in the same way that GE Moore tries to argue that well you had the ability in another possible world. So that's the compatibilist part. Wolf is fully on board with G. E. Moore's notion of a modal compatibilist account of freedom, and that makes sense. Because think about it, right? If if the ability condition is defined as Susan Wolf gives it, the ability to do otherwise, given you had morally good and sufficient reason to do otherwise, well, in the actual world, um, you've already acted on the good, morally good and sufficient reasons. You've done the right thing already, so there is, there are no good or sufficient reasons that uh, would have given you the ability to do otherwise in the first place, or caused you to choose to do the other, to do something else other than you do. You've already acted on the actual good and sufficient reasons that exist in this actual world in doing the morally right thing. So that's why the only way there could be a set of morally good and sufficient reasons to do otherwise is if you go to a counterfactual world, another world where the circumstances are different, and you know maybe then it would you would have had good and sufficient reasons to stay home and not go to the hospital for some reason. Um, so that's that's the limitations there with respect to morally good actions. But ah, but that's not the case when it comes to morally bad actions. It, uh, the ability to do otherwise isn't dependent on some counterfactual or another logically possible world, a counterfactual world. Um, it's actually grounded and rooted in the actual world that we live in because we do have morally good and sufficient reasons in this world, in the actual world, to do otherwise. And we had the ability to do otherwise. And she, she argues this on, the, on two bases. Number one, we have people that are in similar, relevantly similar to us in relevantly similar situations that do in fact do otherwise. So, you know, she get, Wolf gives the example of visiting your sick friend in the hospital through weakness of the will. Oh, it's such a long drive. I just, I don't want to do it. I'll stay home and watch a movie instead. You know, you experience that weakness of the will and you do the wrong thing. You're morally blameworthy because of this. Well, she'll say, well, on the good front, if you had gone to the hospital to see a friend instead of being lazy and watching the movie, um, well, the only way you could have done otherwise, because you were determined by the true and the good, is in a counterfactual world. You know, maybe circumstances would have been different that you would have done the right thing by not going um, to visit your friend or something like that. But it would have all been determined by the prior circumstances in that possible world. It's all like a row of dominoes, just like GE Moore predicted. Ah, but on morally bad actions, in the actual world, you say, the heck with it, I'm reading, I'm watching this movie, I'm too lazy to go and visit my friend. Well, you have good, quote-unquote, good and morally good and sufficient reason to do other than you did. And you have the ability, the actual ability, in the actual world here, right? Because... Other people are similar enough to you in your circumstances. They have the similar situation, their friend in the hospital, and they do make the choice to go and visit their friend. Or even what's the other argument is you yourself in the past have been in similar situations and you've made the right choice in line with the, the quote unquote, the true and the good and gone and visit your, visited your friend in the hospital. So on that basis, it's not the ability to do otherwise isn't based it or grounded in a counterfactual world like it is with respect to morally good actions. And this is Wolf's reason why there's an asymmetry here. With morally good actions, the ability to do otherwise is based only on a counterfactual world, another what you could have done in another possible world. But um, in the case of morally bad actions and weakness of the will, you are, it's not based on a counterfactual at all or another possible world. It's grounded, it's grounded in the fact that there are good and morally good and sufficient reasons in the actual world uh, for you to have done otherwise, other than what you did. And what's more, you have the ability, the provable ability via those two case studies we gave where you could have done 
otherwise if you had chosen to. So, so yeah, and as I said, it, it's basically inexplicable why we have this moral weakness. It's, it's not determined. We're not psychologically determined to do morally bad actions, either through moral neglect or moral weakness, as we're talking about with Acrasia here. Susan Wolf basically shrugs her shoulders, says she doesn't she doesn't understand how this occurs. She doesn't know what the mechanism is. It's just an inexplicable phenomenon. Now, the other view that I want to get into that we had to address was that of uh, Tamar Shapiro, uh, another philosopher who has a great book. Um, now, I'm going to be very careful in what I say about her view. I'm going to be very vague and very general and quick. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is out of respect to her because you know uh, she hasn't published her her book yet and that's not fair to her so I you know we got special access to it as, as grad students to be able to read that before a draft of that before it was actually posted up but so I I haven't posted her PDF version of her book up for for guys to read um, and that's just out of respect for her it's her work I think she has the right to um, publish her book without me sort of stealing her thunder in that um, and uh, again, out of respect for her, please uh, take a look at that book, support her work. It's, it's a great book on the notion of inclination and that sort of thing. Um, just to give you guys the, the name of the book. Uh, so it's, quote unquote, Feeling Like It, A Theory of Inclination and Will. And that will be published by Oxford University Press, hopefully sometime soon, um, by Tamar Shapiro. Um, so yeah, go and support Tamar's work. Um, and yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm going to be very vague here. I'm not going to try to spill all the beans, uh, apart from one or two things from what I wrote about in my essay that you guys saw. Um, so yeah, so, so Tamar's view is more systematic. It's, it's balanced in my view. And, um, essentially what she's, she kind of sees the world as being dualistic in nature, meaning our free, the freedom of our will. Um, we have our rational minds, which deliberate and make rational choices. We also have our animal mind, which sees the world teleologically. Um, and, you know, basically we, we just see the world and objects in the world, not as, in, not as uh, independent objects, but as teleologically infused, so to speak. You know, so the cat sees a, uh, the couch as a scratchy thing. Um, uh, as a thing to be scratched or we see a cake a chocolate cake as chocolatey to be eaten this and this sort of thing this is how our animal mind sees the world as being teleologically infused meaning it, it's a, a system of things that satisfy my desires and ends and stuff like that um so i'm i'm, I'm gonna you guys can read the blog I, again i don't want to give too much away on on that front um but in terms of the mechanism of how a crazy works, how a crazy works, or how freedom of the will, uh, sorry, how a crazy works given for a free will. Um, so Tamar is a libertarian free will person. She's not a compatibilist in any way, or Tamar is not a compatibilist. I'm not sure if it's a he or she. Um, but um, yeah, Shap Shapiro basically thinks that accounts of a crazy in the past suffer from one of two problems so either there's a theory like the brute force theory of inclination which pretty much nobody holds right but this is where our kind of desires come at us and we have no control they force us to it's like they force us to do, want to do something or not so it's uh it's kind of we have no will so that this theory of acrasia under the brute force view is it's kind of well, if, if we're saying, if we're talking about weakness of the will, the brute force view doesn't have any room for the will to play a role at all. There is no will. I'm just being forced by brute forces to go this way, like being blown around by the winds and stuff like that. But similarly, other views, like the, the main traditional view, which is going to be my view more or less, a little bit, uh, some nuance on it, but the traditional view of what is a crazy, what is weakness of the will is... Uh, we act against our better judgment. And Tamar's main thing against this is that, well, how, how does that leave room for weakness? I mean, that maybe you're just using your will. You're still being strong. You're just using your, your strong willed in the wrong direction. You're making the wrong choice or something. You're, you're not 
doing what you should be doing. So there, there's no room for weakness in this account, and that's Tamara's objection. So her notion, in a nutshell, without going into it, is essentially, well, look, I, I think that the will has to play a part. Um, and what happens with weakness of the will is that we retreat, we abandon our... Um, our burden of freedom or burden of responsibility to make the tough choices that's part of our rational mind and instead we flee into our animal mind our animal states and just instinctively do things um so in a nutshell that's her view uh that's all i'm going to say out of respect you know by by her book and that sort of thing but it gives you a sense of how the the crazy works on on tomorrow's view Okay, so now let's get into my view, the main event. So this is what I wrote. Um, so let's, what do I think that the Christian perspective of weakness of the will is? Um, especially in light of, you know, that's that moment of drama where Adam and Eve are faced with that, do I disobey God or not? Do I eat the fruit or not? And of course, they end up making the wrong choice through weakness of the will, and, and they diso choose to disobey God freely. They freely eat that fruit. Um, what the heck happened? Okay, so in the first place, I hold to a libertarian, traditional libertarian free will perspective. I give Alexander Proust's definition of what that means. So it's, it's basically the same as Tamar Spiro's. You're inclined, but you're not determined by your desires or inclinations. Um, I also get Alexander Proust's definition. So an agent X chooses A freely on the basis of a subset of reasons. So those are the influences um, of your desires and that sort of thing, whereby the agent is impressed by certain reasons over another subset of reasons and thereby freely chooses on account of S um, to do action A versus action B. Um, so that's that's sort of what Proust's notion is in a nutshell. And uh, my prof, David Hunter, was kind of right. He said, well, how, well, how does this... He critiqued me by saying, well, how does this... Isn't this compatibilism as well? And the answer is no. So, so Proust is fully libertarian. And it comes down to, you know, what do we mean by freely chooses? And I'm not using that in a G.E. Moore sense of choose. I'm using it in the proper sense where we have this libertarian free will... Uh, notion it's like a branching notion I could I have a dual ability I could do this or not do this regardless I'm not determined in any way by prior circumstances it is I am a prime mover uh, when I make my free choice but I am influenced by past things that take place um, but I'm not I'm never determined by so yeah um, just understand that, that that's part of the definition of what I talking about when I have free will from a libertarian perspective. So getting into a crazier then, how does that work? So with Adam and Eve, they were created in what theologians call the state of integrity. And part of that means that they had a sanctity of will, right? They were created perfect. All of their, desi their desires were aligned toward God and, and all of this. Um, but in order to understand you know, they were created morally perfect. They had a set of proper desires. God, God made them perfectly. And in order to understand my explanation here, so we, we need to do a quick definition um, to understand the difference between first order desires and second order desires or inclinations. So first order desires are lower order desires. You know, they're things about specific, I have a desire to eat that cake. I have a specific desire to, uh, steal that watch or something like that um, but then we have second order desires and these are the higher order desires what really matters it's what one wills what one wants um, to have you know what this is what determines what first order desires we want to become effective or to actualize so these are what really matters and what I'm saying Adam and Eve are in this second order uh, sorry, are, are created perfect and they have the sanctity of their wills. I'm saying that their second order desires were perfectly aligned toward God. So part of the perfection of being a perfect, morally perfect creature, of being of God's creation, being perfect with Adam and Eve, is that their second order, they only have second, a set of second order desires that are all perfectly aligned towards God but they may have first order desires that are sinful and that's good 
that's good. We, in order to be free creatures, we need to be able to encounter sinful first order desires. That's part of a perfect creation. And if you think about it, Jesus was subject to sinful first order desires, and that was not accounted as bad design or or the effects of sin or or sinful on his part. No, this is just simply, it's an essential or necessary part of being a free creature that you are going to be occasionally privy to first order, sinful first order desires that impress upon you and impress upon your wills or, you know, influence your your wills, as I gave with that Alexander Proust definition. And this has an interesting theological implication. Could it be that even in heaven, in our state of final state of salvation, we will still be privy. Part of the perfection of salvation is still being privy as free creatures uh, to sinful first order desires, even in heaven. Um, so it depends on how you answer that. So, some Christians will say, no, we're, we're fully determined in heaven. You know, Catholics will say your soul crystallizes in a state of perfection. So you're kind of like God. You're, you're determined by your morally perfect nature. You'll never be subject to sinful temptation or inclinations. I don't take that path. Um, so I actually do think, yeah, it, it's possible that we will still, for all eternity, be subject to occasional sinful first order desires on this thing. But again, the sanctity of our will, the second time around will be of such a nature after going through what we've done, it will be so perfected uh, and transformed by Christ that those we will only have one set of second order desires. Jesus will get rid of those that second sinful set of second order desires that we acquired in the fall, that'll be done away with. And we'll only have the God-centered sec second order set of desires that we had when God created us originally. And the sanctity of our wills in Christ will be of such strength and such a nature that we will never succumb to any sinful second order desire in the future again. So that's sort of my belief but it that's just sort of an interesting thing D david johnson if you're listening to this i know you love theological implications so that that this might interest you that yeah uh, given what i'm saying here it might be possible for the rest of eternity even in our state of salvation in our resurrected state i believe it's possible we will still be subject to sinful desires but i'm just saying we will never succumb to those ever again uh because the sanctity of our wills in our resurrected state will be so strong that we will never let go and abandon our burden of of freedom so that we reorient our wills towards those those sinful first order desires in the way that Adam and Eve did so yeah just wanted to throw that in there as an interesting theological afterthought or implication there and just for the skeptics listening yes i i can hear you objecting say well why didn't god just create our wills of such a strength to begin with um so that we would never so that adam and eve never would have succumbed and the answer is that's logically impossible he couldn't have just created our wills of such a strength we had to go through the process of have, violating our sanctity of will and entering the state of corruption uh and then being re resurrected through Christ and regaining the sanctity of our wills again in, in our resurrected state. So it's that Molinistic answer. You can't, you couldn't have gotten to the end state by just bypassing the the state of corruption. You, we had to go through that state of corruption. Well, we didn't have to logically, but or metaphysically speaking, Adam and Eve hypothetically could have chosen not to eat the fruit, and then they would have automatically entered that that uh, strong that state of salvation final state uh perhaps that could have been the case um but i'm just saying that's not what happened uh it seems that all human free creatures would have done what adam and eve did and we we made that choice to sin thereby necessitating the process of going through the state of corruption in order so that our our wills could have been redeemed to regain the sanctity of will of such strength that we would never again succumb like Adam and Eve did. So you can't just bypass the state of corruption uh, to get this strong sanctity of will. Um, yeah, and, and God could only have created the sanctity of will as it was, as Adam and Eve had it. And it was up to them as a free creature in order to, to gain the strength, they had to exercise their free will. 
Um, unfortunately, ex they exercised it in the wrong way and gained a state of corruption. But going through this state of corruption, going through Jesus' work on the cross and atoning death and work of sanctification within us, um, we know God promises us that we will, our sanctity of wills, our state of resurrected integrity will be of such strength that we never have to worry about sinning again or making a sinful choice um, like Adam and Eve did. So, yeah, you, you, you can't just get to the end. Um, that's all I'm trying to say there. So, yeah, get, getting back to the main topic about um, about Adam and Eve and, and you know, the, this distinction between first and second order desires in Adam and Eve's state of, original state of uh, sanctity of the will or that state of integrity that they were in uh, back in the garden. Where it comes into a problem is at the order of second order desires. Um, so, you know, that's where what, where our will comes in, the higher order desire. Do, do we want to manifest those sinful first order desires or not? So in, in terms of weakness of the will, what I think happened is that I agree with S Susan Wolf that all of our second order desires, in order to be created perfect, we were designed or manufactured to be pointing true north, to towards the quote unquote true and the good, aka to be perfectly aligned with God and what God wants. But that takes mental effort. There's a willpower to keep us aligned true north in the in the face of sinful first order desires that are impacting upon our wills. So that takes actual effort. And this is where I agree with Tamar Shapiro's notion for the mechanism of how crazy works. I think there's this letting go. Um, so, you, you know, we kind of let go and this points our wills towards sinful first order desires where they overcome our, sec our proper second order desires. And that's what weakness of the will is. It's this abandoning of your burden of freedom so that your will is becomes oriented to improperly towards first order desires that are not consistent with your second order desires and it, it takes willpower on our part to maintain our our alignment towards second order desires and first order desires that are consist and only first order desires that are consistent with those god given proper second order desires now it's important to note here that uh i'm not arguing like a compatibilist like val um our second, the second order desires do main, maintain their force. They they remain in um, in prominence. They they are. It's not that we're replacing one set of desires with and pre preferencing a new set of desires, which are become stronger um, and overwhelm those second order desires here. No, we we still maintain knowledge that you no, know, what we really want, we really want those only to only. Uh, actualize first order desires that are consistent with our second order desires. We we know that these are still our number one top preference and priority, but it's just a momentary momentarily weakness where we just let go and and kind of willfully reorient our wills to. Well, I'm I'm gonna go with this one, even though I know I prefer this. It's not what I want in this moment of drama. Uh, I'm just going to let go. I'm going to abandon that. I'm sick and tired of the burden of being free, the burden of, you know, making that rational choice that, no, I'm going to fulfill what I really want and, and actualize only the desires, first order desires that are consistent with what my will tells me my second order desires are. It, it's, it's that letting go. It's an abandonment. That's the mechanism. And that's what I think Tamar Shapiro's brilliant, um, contribution is that I really take heart heart with so it's not the same as what Val would say it's not that we're temporarily deluding ourselves into thinking that oh well these sinful first order desires are more important to us than fulfilling our second order desires or, or something like that no we, we are always cognizant of the fact that no this isn't what I want um, I really want this but temporarily I'm just I'm letting go I'm, I'm gonna give in and the heck with it. I'm just going to fulfill or actualize this sinful desire. And and I think that's that's true phenomenologically. That's what it feels like for me. It makes sense of the Apostle Paul's writings where he's like, I, I do what I hate constantly. I know better. I know this isn't what I want, but I do it anyways. 
Um, and yeah, I, I think that Tamar's notion of the mechanism being a, a notion of letting go or abandoning ourselves or fleeing the responsibility or burden of freedom, of our freedom uh, to actualize those first order desires is, is great. Uh, obviously, I don't agree necessarily with with her notion of the animal mind and, and, and that sort of thing. That's not necessarily what I'm saying happened with Adam and Eve, but I like that mechanism of, you know, letting go or abandoning your burden of freedom. So, yeah, that's, that's what I think happened with Adam and Eve there. So that's what it is. That That's what weakness of the will is in my understanding. Yeah, it, it doesn't impact on God. I know David Hunter was asking questions like, well, why would they be privy to these first order desires? As I said, it, it's good. It's an essential and necessary feature of being a free will creature. Even God gets privy to sinful first order desires in the form of Jesus and that sort of thing. He was tempted, and that's literal in the Bible. Um, so that's just the burden of being a, a free will creature. Uh, one difference, though, with God, there is a question with God outside of a, an acquired human nature. Does he get tempted and stuff like that? Probably not, given, the, given those circumstances. So it's not an essential feature of all f free beings, but it is an essential property of all free creatures. Um, and that goes back to the notion, Evan Fails versus Dr. William Lane Craig, the notion on free, can God, could God have created a perfect free creature? And the answer is no. Only a being like God, an uncreated God, could be perfect in terms of not being subject to any sinful first order desires. Um, but anyone that's taken on the role of a creature, including God, when he becomes acquires a human nature, then he will be subject to these first order desires. And that's good. That's, that's the way, that's out of logical necessity, the way that it has to be. That's part of being perfect. That's part of what it means to be a free creature. Um, so, so yeah, hopefully that makes sense. It, as I said, in a nutshell, we have these second order desires and our wills are pointed like a compass, true north towards these go proper God-centered second order desires. And our second order desires are to actualize only first order desires that are consistent with those God-centered second order desires. But it takes willpower. And this is where I disagree with Tamar Shapiro. I just don't understand it all. Tamar Shapiro just kind of says it's inexplicable as to why we why someone would abandon their burden of freedom. Whereas I think the Christian biblical answer is no. We chose to let go. We, ch we perf purposefully said, I'm just going to let go. I I'm sick of the burden of trying to maintain and this orientation towards God-centered uh, desires, I'm just going to let go and uh, reorient my will towards this first order. Okay, let's do it. This sinful first order desire, let's do it. So we occur, we occur moral blameworthiness for on this front, and that's why Adam and Eve were blamed for weakness of the will. Uh, Tamar Shapiro just doesn't make sense to me when she's when she denies this. Shockingly, she. She says it's not a free will choice for us to abandon our burden of freedom. And that's sort of a main difference between me and her and my case for Adam and Eve. And why I think they were morally blameworthy for giving in to their, and experiencing this weakness of the will and then making that sinful choice to disobey God in the garden. Okay, so what about after the fall then? Okay, now once we have these sinful effects, we've acquired a sin disease and this sinful nature. What do I think is happening there? Um, and on, in this case, I think that what happened is we acquired a second set of second order desires. So we, we not only have maintain a remnant of our God-given second order desires, you know, in that state of integrity where we have the sanctity of will that God created with Adam and Eve, but due to Adam and Eve's choice to sin, human beings now acquired a second set of second order desires sinful ones, ones that are pointed due south. And uh, so, you know, towards Satan and doing evil and stuff like that. We now have a set of second order desires that are oriented to the south, that are oriented towards evil. And this obviously brings in a whole bunch of, of corrupt and stuff like that. And our natural state now, now that we're in a state, uh, what theologians call the quote unquote state of corruption, 
our natural orientation or default is towards this sinful set of second order desires. And unfortunately, it doesn't take much effort at all for us to be oriented in that direction. In fact, it's just where we naturally go when, when you just let go. This is what the Bible, I think, is talking about. When we have a sinful nature, and it's impossible for us to orient ourselves to, back towards this God-given second order desires without God's help, without the help of the Holy Spirit. We're just hopeless. We'll just forever be oriented towards this sinful set of second order desires and actualizing you know sinful first order desires we will never do what's good without the help of the holy spirit maintaining the remnant of our state of integrity and that sort of thing so that's what i think the state of corruption is it was this acquiring of a second second set of sinful second order desires and not only that but the this these sinful second order desires uh that gear us or orient us due south or towards evil you know orient our wills towards evil and and desiring to actualize only sinful first order desires this has kind of like a an added benefit for human beings in our state of corruption it has an added attraction a gravitational pull if you will that pulls us toward it it takes even more willpower and and we need the help of god to overcome that attractive force and overcome that and reorient our wills toward the north or toward those God, original God-centered second-order desires that we had. Um, so that's why it's it's even worse than what Adam and, Adam and Eve had. We, we have a new set of second-order desires and those second-order desires are attractive. They, they have some kind of pull on our wills that gravitates us naturally towards them over the God-centered second-order desires. And this is why it's, the Bible says we need the help of the Holy Spirit. We need God to help help us through, to, through our willpower and the help of the Holy Spirit to reorient back to due north, back toward those God-centered second-order desires as we should be. So obviously, in terms of a crazier or a weakness of will, and weakness just implies an insufficient capacity being used, um, yeah, we, we have weakness of the will when we, if we don't maintain that orientation. And it's harder for us to do that because we have this draw, natural draw that drags us to, this, to reorient our wills always towards the sinful second order desires that we've acquired after the, that we've acquired during the fall. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that makes makes uh, some sense as to what my theory is. Yeah, so and one one thing that he yeah, asked, so so it is true that yeah, you have to know, right? You're you're acting against what you want, what you prefer to have happen, and this is why the Apostle Paul will say stuff like, "I do what I hate. I I know that I should be oriented towards God, but I'm being drawn by these sin, my natural sinful." orientation towards these sinful second order desires all the time and i can't resist i, I give in uh, and this is why i rely on the holy spirit to help strengthen me enough so that i can exercise my willpower and keep myself oriented strictly north strictly to the god set centered and original god designed set of second order desires um, whereby i only actualize first order desires that are consistent with what god wants rather than reorienting towards my s sinful second order desires that set of second order desires that want to only actualize satanic or evil first order desires um so yeah that that's in a nutshell what my theory is i think i've covered all the base bases there all right yeah um that's it a, a nice sh short episode i hope you guys enjoy um, as i said i'm i'm going to i'm going to work on my philosophy of emotions thing and get up a, a podcast quick easy podcast like this about my thesis on on the philosophy of emotions and their role within a moral moral epistemology um so yeah maybe in a week or so i'll, I'll put that up um i also am going to be on the proselytize or apostatize show on the subject of eschatology i've been invited to speak on 
Um, that's not a subject that I know a heck of a lot about or am knowledgeable in, but I'm going to give it my all and look into it a little bit when I get get a chance. And yeah, look, look forward to that show. I'll be posting it up on, on Real Seekers here for you guys. So yeah, till then, have a great week and take care.